The next session is called uh, Present Digital, um, part one, and uh, which suggests that there will be a part two, which there will be tomorrow. Um, and in a sense, they are inspired by uh, the section next door, which is Art Dubai Digital, um, and involve uh, a number of uh, characters that are related to the program and um, but also the sort of broader set of questions and issues that um, that gravitate around that section. Um, so what are the latest forces shaping digital art, NFT innovation, and crypto communities? Um, Brian uh, Duacor and Maria Paula Fernandez share stories about their practices in worlds of Web3 writing, publishing, curating, and protocol design. And um, this is going to be mod uh, hosted by uh, Lucas uh, Amaka, who you may have met earlier on in the afternoon, who is from One of One uh, Work. So will you please join me in welcoming uh, MP, uh, Brian, and Lucas. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shumon, for the introduction. I'm just going to quickly um, run through who we have on stage in a bit more detail, and then I'll leave it to you guys to, to present your individual projects, and then we'll dive into a conversation from there. So on stage, we have uh, Maria Paula Fernandez, co-founder at jpeg.space, style icon and shit poster extraordinaire. For those of you not in the know, officially reaching the level of shit poster on Twitter is the highest honors in the scene. She previously co-founded the Department of Decentralization, a collective that unites various crypto and blockchain communities in Berlin. The DoD has hosted a number of successful conferences that not only launched the Ethereum testnet Gurley, but also produced iconic imagery of MP and some of the brightest minds in the future of finance, including Vitalik Buterin, in furry suits. Her current venture, jpeg.space, is a platform that provides tools to promote and preserve the NFT ecosystem's cultural objects. If there ever was a Berlin on the blockchain, JPEG would be it. It's cool, it's grassroots, and it has the strongest of opinions on on- and off-chain culture. We're also joined by Brian Droitcourt, Editor-in-Chief of Outland. Outland is a platform dedicated to fostering critical conversation around emerging dig digital technologies and their connection to contemporary art. They publish writing in form of criticism and conversations, deliver insights into some of the leading uh, collections of the Web3 world, and last but not, and definitely not least, they publish their own NFT projects recently with artists such as Leo Villarreal, Ian Chang, uh, and Fang Li Jun, among others. The pinned tweet in his Twitter profile says, sometimes the best thing in a museum is an open window. Outland is just that open window to Web3. It brings a breath of fresh air that is deep thought forged in the long tradition of art writing to the narrow space that is all our Twitter feeds. So without further ado, Brian, do you want to start uh, speaking about Outland? Sure. Yeah, it's on. Hi. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, so yeah, as Lucas mentioned, Outland is a platform for digital art that publishes um, artist editions and criticism. Uh, and so, so just to give some examples, the last project we released was Leo Villarreal's Cosmic Bloom, which uh, is an edition of 1300 uh, works, each of which um, layers 3D motion graphics in formations that suggest microorganisms or uh, star systems, something very large or very small. And these are not videos, but live simulations that are constantly changing. Before that was Ian Cheng's Three Face, which is an NFT that reads the history of the collector's wallet and creates an image that's a sort of psychological portrait of the collector. Um, so we're really interested in working with artists who are using the digital medium in innovative ways and, and pushing the limit of what NFTs can be. Um, and my role as editor-in-chief, I run the magazine. We are publishing a, a few times a week articles that give perspectives from critics, artists, collectors on the NFT space. Um, we recently started an initiative where we 
we'll spend a, a couple of weeks on a certain theme that is led by a guest editor. Our current guest editor is Simon Denny, who's really interested in how the blockchain has uh, impacted ideas about ownership and how those play out in conceptions of digital land in virtual worlds like Decentraland as well as um, governance in the real world and the stewardship of natural resources. And then Shumon Basaras, our next guest editor, will be publishing some of the conversations at the Global Art Forum, as well as new related content. So Outland is one of several initiatives that claim to bridge the gap between the art world and the NFT space. That phrase has become something of a cliche, but I think it's really useful to think about what it actually means. Like, what is the art world? What is the NFT space? And what is the gap between them that needs bridging? As I see it, the art world is an ecosystem of institutions, including museums, galleries, auction houses, um, art fairs, magazines, MFA programs, art history departments, and so on, that create the conditions for the exchange of social influence and cultural capital into money and vice versa. So there is a lot of art that exists outside this ecosystem, but can't really participate in those exchanges because they're not, they don't really circulate in the, in the same way. Um, the NFT space has become a home to a lot of people who are excluded from that system. They like art, they make art with digital tools, and starting in the late 2010s, they started gathering on these marketplaces like Super Rare and so on, where they could uh, use crypto to sell and exchange their works. And, uh, and for a while, this was sort of a peer-to-peer -peer market. You know, some of the early adopters talk about how it was just the same $20 getting passed back and forth among like 20 people. Uh, but then towards the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, a lot of um, uh, crypto users saw the potential to treat these works as speculative instruments and the prices started getting really high. Uh, that culminated in the uh, sale of Beeple at Christie's for $69 million. And of course, this was, came as a real shock to the art world because the art world had thought they were the only uh, space where these kinds of uh, conversions of art for that amount of money were possible. Um, and that sort of revealed the gap between these two, I think, where the sort of like work of critics and curators to make those exchanges of cultural capital for money were, were, didn't really exist in the NFT space. So Outland's approach is to insert that into the NFT space to, to create a forum for criticism and, and curation that um, sort of moves some of what the art world does in, into the NFT space. Uh, sometimes that can feel kind of conservative. Like I come from an art publishing background. I used to work at Art in America as an editor. Um, but I think that criticism is maybe N not really like the only thing that matters in the space is just adding to the ecosystem uh, that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of publishing in Web3 exists in this sort of white paper mentality where people are talking about their own projects or their, their startups projects and, and sharing that. And that has a lot, you know, that, that sort of syncs with this idea of like ownership of your own uh, intellectual work that is so important to Web3. But criticism, in the best sense, is not necessarily like the enforcement of some kind of standard, but rather a demonstration of the attention that someone has paid to an artwork and an implicit argument that other people should be paying attention to this too. It's writing in the third person instead of the first person. Um, and I think that is an important addition to the kind of publishing that already exists there. And um, hopefully can uh, make a positive difference in the space. So that's what I have to say about Outland. Wonderful, thank you very much. Do you wanna take? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Maria Paula, I'm Argentinian, and the reason that I got into blockchain is because I'm Argentinian. Um, so <laughs> I was born not trusting the government or the economy or anything at all. Um, I was born not trusting my peers. So the promise of a trustless system and a transparent system sounded like a perfect solution or a, an alternative for what you know we were living in uh, for as long as I can remember, because this has been like a, probably a hundred years or a little bit more of instability. Um, 
of course, I got into blockchain in 2017, and this rang true to what we were building back then. It doesn't ring true anymore. Um, I don't know what we're building. Um, I know what uh, I'm building, and I know th what the community that I'm working with is building as well. And it's a new kind of awareness. Um, basically, beyond uh, what uh, beyond what Brian said about uh, NFTs having become a medium of speculation and a little bit more than that, you know, with some art sprinkles on top, um, this has happened because the community lacks critical thinking. Um, and critical thinking in, uh, in such a fragmented and big community can only be achieved, in my opinion, at least, um, if we all do it together, um, you know, if we crowdsource that knowledge. Because already NFTs are such complex assets, they're financial assets, they're art as, uh, assets, they can be compounded, you can take loans with them. Um, they, uh, you know, there's blockchain as a medium uh, that translates it sometimes into NFTs. Uh, there's so many things. There's uh, obviously right now uh, as well, uh, like high-end pieces of technology that you would only see in Wall Street uh, for high frequency trading, uh, trading, uh, you know, these JPEGs online. So it all presents such a complex phenomena that uh, you need many experts to actually tackle and to actually, you know, construct the dialogue. And what we do at JPEG is try to, you know, create that kind of like criticism as well, but in a way that uh, we just get people together. We just, uh, you know, create different tools. Uh, one of the tools is uh, called uh, very tanning in cheek canons. Um, canons are lists of NFTs around a particular category. For example, conceptual art NFTs is a very popular canon in I, our community and people propose the NFTs and then they vote them in or out, of course. And uh, yeah, with that, you know, people have to make a case for the NFT. Um, they, they also discuss on the Discord and it all, you know, ends up forming a very interesting phenomenon of people just discussing what it means to be um, a collector, what it means to be an artist, what it means to have a piece and what it means to be in blockchain in 2023. Um, so that's basically what we're facilitating right now and trying to find a little bit of hope in a world that has become a, you know, a meme, basically. <laughs> or many. <laughs> um, it, it sounds to me like you're both building kind of Web3 orientated, very kind of contemporary approaches to, to you know, what was criticism and what was curation. And my, my question is, is there, is there any line of tradition that you see your respective projects in or, or, or do you feel that, that you know, the, the decentralization that you were speaking about actually, you know, gives us a totally new blueprint for what, for what is going on? I think, for example, to f be able to criticize NFTs and to contextualize NFTs, um, you do need to have, uh, you know, a, at least, you know, basic knowledge of art history. Um, n knowledge of the past is essential to uh, classify them, forecast and, you know, deal with the future as well. Uh, that's, a, you know, that's, that's an obvious statement, of course. Uh, I uh, and you know talking about art, um, the framework I guess it's the same one. Um, good art would always be good art, and bad art, you know, always will be bad art. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that uh, the thing that people focus the most, at least in our uh, particular community, is on thought-provoking. Um, assets, pieces, NFTs. Um, and that tradition, uh, you know, comes from, I don't know, uh, like, yeah, the practice of, uh, you know, open discourse in, in Greece. Uh, so, yeah, tradition is extremely important. What about you, Brian? Yeah, I mean, I 
say again, I'm always a little embarrassed to say this, but Outland is kind of like traditional. It's very centralized. Uh, we have a lot of contributors, but they all kind of come through me uh, before they get published. And But I think that kind of practice of editorial care is really important, just like being in conversation with writers, thinking about what's the best way to express these ideas and, and get them out there uh, is always going to be valuable. Um, but I think what we are doing, I mean, it, 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 it isn't a tradition of sort of innovative publications. Like if you think of what um, Art Forum was doing in the 60s to try to spotlight uh, conceptual art and publishing like artist projects in the pages, I kind of feel like that might, you know, uh, might be analogous to what we're doing and just trying to find a, a language for writing about projects that aren't really covered in the mainstream art press. Um, and develop ways like another project that I'm working on is um, a writing workshop about generative art that we're co-organizing with art blocks where we're inviting people who are like trained in art history work as curators work as writers to just get a better familiarity with the tools and processes that artists are using uh, so there can be some more like intelligent discussion about this kind of work which has um, really risen in prominence I think I I just want to say I think it's a really cool initiative and you know it just bringing people from different walks of life as well into you know this like sort of new world of NFTs and trying to prove their expertise uh, and gaining expertise from others uh, by you know participating in workshops is you know how like you know criticism will be built in the future as well. Well, it goes hand in hand with with your statement that that you know in order to, to understand blockchain and the ecosystem you need an interdisciplinary approach you need an interdisciplinary yeah. team because it touches on so many different objects uh, on so many different topics and you know interdisciplinarity seems to be kind of a standard of our time but at the same time we one big question mark for me is audience is is the question of audience like who are we actually doing it for are we are are we working for the twitter feeds are we working for the 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 the, the art audience are we like who 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 do you think who do you consider to be your audience and how do you kind of interact with it because you both have very different approaches in 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 the way you interact with with the people that actually consume the the, the products and services you make sure um you know I've, I've been working in art publishing for a long time and seeing the kind of numbers about readership and i know that art criticism is always going to be a kind of niche uh interest for a lot of people but at the same time um it can also build a brand. I mean, you, you kind of see how the fact that an article is published about a certain artist gets a lot of um, attention on Twitter and social media, maybe more so than the people who actually read it. So I think audiences, there's, you know, there's like the strong ties and the weak ties, right? The people who do care about our criticism really care about it a lot and they're going to read it, but then there are people who kind of appreciate the fact that it exists. Um, and I think there's also like a difference in audiences between, uh, you know, the collectors and the readers. And I think the goal is to sort of bring those together. But I think there's always going to be like a, a difference in people who are interested in NFTs for, um, you know, collecting and speculation and people who are interested in them for, um, you know, appreciating digital art or or learning about this sort of new field of ideas. I really... Um, think what JPEG has done in your Discord is is great. I mean, they were really hosting these amazing conversations about um, categorical definitions of digital art and different kinds of NFTs. Um, and that's a really great example of audience building that. Um, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I like my answer is actually really short. I'm working and my community is working for anyone that's interested on Web3 culture. 
uh, we work on capturing that and we work on capturing particular moments in time um, in different ways. You know, one is the Discord, of course, and, you know, a lot of the conversations from Discord get uh, rewritten into blog posts. Uh, we also do the same with, you know, Twitter spaces, but also, you know, the fact that uh, our canons, our list of things, and uh, the second product that I didn't mention, but it's also really nice, uh, it's exhibitions. There are exhibitions of NFTs that you own or not own, and then all of that is getting stored on chain. So there's always a permanent record of what is happening at that moment um, in both of the of, of the tools. So anyone that's interested on, you know, taking a glimpse into Web3 culture, internet culture, um, in a more um I guess it's uh, it's in a more granular way because you know the way that we, we, we do classify. I, as you know, one of uh, one of the our streams of expertise uh, is welcome to you know just join the platform. So on on that, like, what what are the observations between so the exhibition tool? I know this because I've I've used it. You know, I can make an exhibition from from my personal point of view versus the Canons tool that is actually a crowdsourced exhibition tool in a way where you try to find a, a, a common consensus between users which NFTs belong into which category. What is the, the, um, the, the not the specific usage numbers, but the relationship between the two and how do they, like which one is more popular? What is, what is the one that you're more, most excited about? Um, I'm most excited about the canons because uh, there's no proper taxonomy on NFTs. Uh, discovering NFTs is very difficult and there's fantastic art going around. Um, so the way, you know, because the technology basically started in 2017 and uh, technology in, in blockchain evolves very, very fast, but very, very sloppily. So uh, that created a whole uh, problem of incompatibility and la relabeling all of those NFTs that have been produced throughout the years is an impossible task. So I am really into the idea of crowdsourcing that the possibility of discovering a little bit better. And, pres uh, and it's also a way of taking care. It's a way of preserving. It's it's a way of historicizing and contextualizing. So it can be manifold. You know, it's just uh, the product is uh, obviously now five months old. So it's very, it's very early to tell, but that's where we're going. And with exhibitions, for example, something that, uh, that really became apparent to us during Art Dubai, where we saw so many amazing galleries displaying NFTs, is that there there's beyond photographs and beyond cute catalogs, there's no correct way to, um, to document properly what's happening. And uh, exhibitions um, create that. And it doesn't have to do with the gallery. You know, you don't have to be a gallery owner to come to JPEG and create an exhibition of what is going on at Art Dubai. Um, I can do it tomorrow if I have a list of works. And all of that would live uh, permanently on chain. So we are, uh, you know, both things are creating, you know, a sort of records for the for long term to capture what's going on. You know, I think, of course, the promise of the canons is uh, incredibly beneficial to the space, especially uh, for us, uh, that we take NFTs seriously, that we believe that uh, there's great art uh, in between the sea of uh, PFPs and nonsense. Um, so I'm most excited about that. Uh, but exhibitions, uh, I think they're a very interesting tool for galleries that are experiencing digital as well. Yeah, I, I would just add, um, you know, so much of the NFTs that have been produced over the last few years just appeared on these big platforms like OpenSea or Super Rare or Foundation, where those platforms don't really do anything to categorize or define or uh, present the work in any way. It's just left up to the artist to to define what they're doing. But it is 
important when this is living in a social space for a community or an audience to to find that, and that's traditionally been the role of the press, of critics, but, um, and, and so that's something that we're trying to do, but I think also like the tools that JPEG is using to to crowdsource those definitions and have those conversations about like, what actually is this? Like, what kind of trends can we identify? Which works matter in these contexts is, is really important. Um, can you maybe explain quickly to the audience, speaking about like longevity and putting things on chain versus off chain, like what, what does that actually mean? What, is, what does it mean to record a consensus on a blockchain versus, you know, re having artwork that is, that is on chain versus artwork that is off chain? Kind of the, the longevity aspect of the, of, of, of the conservational work that, you know, in a way both of you are doing. So, uh, First of all, like so, JPEG storing, uh, you know, the the data. We're not storing the, uh, you know, the the visual part. Um, that's the job of uh, every platform and every artist. And I sure hope that they're applying standards to that, because we've lost a lot from uh, 2018 already. Um, so what we're trying to do is capture, you know, what's going on with the NFTs, which NFTs are related to which ones and uh, under which category. Um, that's the aspect of preservation that we're taking care of. We're the librarians here. <laughs> but yeah, maybe you can talk more about uh, on-chain. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that what Outlands Magazine does is not on chain, but it's sort of this like older tradition of, you know, j just having it in, something in writing, having an article, which, I mean, I guess tweets are also out there online and gonna be preserved, but so, like an, an article is gonna be easier to find and have more context um, than like a single post. And so I think that act of like writing and, and, and publishing and sort of having something that, um, is going to be a resource for, for the future is important, even if it's not on chain. Um. And both of your projects are, correct me if I'm wrong, um, like purely digital. There's no physical or, or no, 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 no uh, physical output of, 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 of any of your work. Is, is that something you think about? How do you think the, the, the NFT space or like the NFT art space in general translates to you know, relationships IRL or experiences IRL? Um, is that something you put any thought into? Well, we do exhibitions. I, yeah, we just had an exhibition a la Namjoon Paik in Paris where I had to, well, we work with a vendor that connected 15 CRT TVs to NFTs. Um, and we do a bunch of exhibitions all around, you know, and we try to translate the NFTs to exciting different formats. We work with the artists, so, you know, an NFT can become a giant wall decal, um, you know, and we, we try to, you know, display them, you know, in different screens in, uh, for example, not the latest and uh, most fanciest LED screen, but something that looks a little bit um, odd so that people, you know, extract the, uh, you know, the experience of the piece. Um, so there's some physicality to all of it. And I do, you know, I do also like physical art more than digital art, I have to admit. Uh, but we mostly live in the digital, yeah. Yeah, we've also done some events and presenting uh, the works we're producing in person. Like the last one was a Leo Villarreal event in London in October. But yeah, it's definitely something that I'd like to do more of and also do, um, you know, if not print publications, at least do some kinds of in-person discussions um, because those sort of face-to-face -face, uh, encounters are really important for, for building communities and, and building readerships. So to me, it always seems like the, the NFT world, you know, has, has this very Twitter section and then there is, you know, the, the, the part of it that crosses over into the, the trad art world, so to say, and then there's some parts in the middle where would you, some of you kind of said it in the intro, but where would you see yourself? And are there other kind of peers that you would, you, you know, you would think about that our, that our audience can, can, can look up and check out just to kind of map out the space? So JPEG is in the middle. 
<laughs> it's in that part in the middle. Um, we do collaborate with institutions, mostly knowledge sharing. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, reviewing the the last uh, Serpentine report for a uh, future art ecosystems, and you know we work with RL curators. We work with educating. Uh, you know, different people that are very interested in getting into the NFT space, old net art galleries that are, you know, looking for a revamp. Um, and our peer institutions are all, all of those. Uh, so our peer, uh, I guess, projects and uh, not institutions because Web3 doesn't have institutions um, are those that are thinking long term. So I would say definitely uh, you're a buddy. Uh, <laughs> Um, then, uh, of course, Zian, uh, that uh, Shumoni is a co-founder, and other like-minded uh, institution, institution, um, I don't know, of course, one of one, um, while the residency program uh, that just launched as well. Uh, Fingerprints DAO is another great example, but uh, they're all in the art first, long-term uh, part of the NFT world. Yeah, I mean, I've been involved in digital art and net art for a long time. Like I worked with Rhizome from 2008 to 2012. And so there is this community of artists who are interested in technology and new media that is sort of marginal to the art world and is also now participating in the NFT world, but they're a little bit marginal there too because they're not these like big high profile NFT projects. All, some of those artists have done very well. And so I feel like that is sort of my community and I don't know if it's like in between the two, it's kind of to the side of both, but it's becoming more prominent as more institutions um, are looking to digital art and ways to collect it and exhibit it. That's the sort of community that they're, they're looking to. What what do you how do you how do you see the perception of like you know the the, the pre NFT net art crowd towards the very Twitter Twitter oriented kind of NFT art crowd? Is there is are they moving together? Are they you know two separate worlds? What's the relationship? Well, shit posters recognize shit posters, I think. And so <laughs> there's always going to be people on Twitter who, who find each other and have to share a similar sensibility and uh, build a community that way. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not really coming up with any. Specific. I just follow you on Twitter, honestly. I can't stand any, anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, what's, what's actually really happening, um, Twitter is... Uh, so, uh, you know, Twitter is so va uh, vapid. And combined with that, of course, now that Elon Musk decided to fire everyone uh, but himself, um, the, the experience of Twitter is an absolute disaster. It's impossible to find anything. So I see more and more the expert communities coming to Discord. And, you know, we're seeing that uh, not only with the JPEG Discord, which is a great place, uh, but also, you know, for example, the Folia Discord. Folia is a marketplace for conceptual pieces and they're, uh, they're publishers as well. Um, they're uh, founded by Sam Hart, who is a pioneer on blockchain art and Billy Rennekamp, a you know, former net artist, a super software engineer. Um, I see also, you know, great communities uh, around, you know, for example, new projects like Archive, uh, Friends with Benefits, um, I'm not capturing the same on Twitter. Uh, luckily, I can't wait for Twitter to be dead um, from my ide ideological perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, I'll, and yeah, hopefully there's more IRL as well. So speaking of, of IRL and communities, uh, do, do you represent to me, you know, the Berlin part of, of, of the digital art world and you represent to me the New York part of the digital art world. Do you see any differences? Is it the same? Are there, are there like, locational manifestations of, 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 of the NFT art world? Or is it is it really an international, entirely internationalized thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a huge difference. I think the Berlin crypto scene is really invested in um, the idea of decentralization and trying to build uh, infrastructure that people can participate in and like ideas of shared governance, whereas in the US, it's really seen as uh, a way to make money. And maybe that's just a cultural difference of the, of, of the countries. Um, 
but yeah, it, it, I I don't know what your experience is, but I feel like the people in New York, like there are people who are like building DAOs, but I think there is, more, it's sort of more about like networking than necessarily like a real commitment to decentralization. Although there are certainly people in New York who are interested in that, but it's just not as um, top of mind as it is in Berlin. Um, I think you're right, uh, but uh, of course New York has a very long tradition of experimenting with media arts that Berlin doesn't have, so for me always uh, visiting is an incredibly rewarding experience and reassuring, uh, but Berlin has a very long time tradition with experimenting with blockchain as a medium in art, and with experiment with blockchain as a way of resource sharing across creative communities, and uh, I haven't seen that anywhere else. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I've totally forgotten about questions, so we ran out of time. I'm sure Maria, Paola and Brian will be happy to have a personal dialogue with you. Uh, thank you, Shimon.